Poor Superman by Fritz Leiber. The first angry rays of the sun, which startlingly enough, still rose in the east at 24-hour intervals, pierced the lacy tops of Atlantic combers and touched thousands of sleeping Americans with unconscious fear because of their unpleasant similarity to the rays from World War III's atomic bombs. They turned to blood the witch circle of rusty steel skeletons around the inferno of Manhattan. Without comment, they pointed a cosmic finger at the tarnished brass plaque commemorating the martyrdom of the three physicians after the dropping of the hell bomb. They tenderly touched the rosy skin and strawberry bruises on the naked shoulders of a girl sleeping off a drunk on the furry and radiantly heated floor of a nearby roof garden. They struck green magic from the glossy blot that was old Washington. Twelve hours before, they had revealed things as eerily beautiful and more ravaged in Asia and Russia. They pinked the white walls of the colonial dwellings of Morton Opperly near the Institute for Advanced Studies. Upstairs, they slanted impartially across the pharaoh-like and open face of the elderly physicist and the ugly, sleep-surly one of young Willard Farquhar in the next room. And in nearby New Washington, they made of the spire of the Thinker's Foundation a blue and optimistic glory that outshone White House Jr. It was America approaching the end of the 20th century, America of jukebox burlesque and your local radiation hospital, America of the mask fad for women and mystic Christianity. America of the off-the-bosom dress and the new blue laws. America of the endless war and the loyalty direct and the loyalty detector. America of the marvelous Maisie and the monthly rocket to Mars. America of the thinkers and, a few remembered, the Institute. Knock on titanium. What do you do for blackouts? Please, lover, don't think when I'm around. America as combat-shocked and crippled as the rest of the bomb-shattered planet. Not one impudent photon of the sunlight penetrated the triple-paned, polarizing windows of George Helmuth's bedroom in the Thinker's Foundation, yet the clock in his brain awakened him to the minute or almost switching off the educational sandman in the midst of the phrase, applying tensor calculus to the nucleus. He took a deep, even breath and cast his mind to the limbs of the world and his knowledge. It was a somewhat shadowy vision, yet he noted, with impartial approval, definitely less shadowy than yesterday morning. Employing a rapid mental scanning technique, he next cleared his memory chains of false associations, including those acquired while asleep. These chores completed, he held his finger on a bedside button, which rotated the polarizing window panes until the room slowly filled with a muted daylight. Then, still flat on his back, he turned his head until he could look at the remarkably beautiful blonde girl asleep beside him. Remembering last night, he felt a pang of exasperation, which he instantly quelled by taking his mind to a higher and dispassionate level from which he could look down on the girl and even himself as quaint, clumsy animals. Still, he grumbled silently. Caddy might have had enough consideration to clear out before he awoke. He wondered if he shouldn't have used his hypnotic control on the girl to smooth their relationship last night. And for a moment, the world that would send her and for a moment, the word that would send her into deep trance trembled on the tip of his tongue. But no, that special power of his over her was reserved for far more important purposes. Pumping dynamic tension into his 20-year-old muscles and confidence into his 60-year-old mind, the 40-year-old thinker rose from, his, rose from bed. No covers had to be thrown off. Nuclear central heating made them unnecessary. He stepped into his clothing. The severe tunic, tights, and soccasins of the modern businessman. Next, he glanced at the message type beside his phone, washing down with ginger ale a, vito immune, a vita amino enzyme tablet, and walked to the window. There, 
gazing along the rows of newly planted mutant oaks lining Decontamination Avenue, his smooth face broke into a smile. It had come to him, the next big move in the intricate game making up his life and mankind's. Come to him during sleep, as so many of his best decisions did, because he regularly employed the time-saving technique of Samothought, which could function at the same time as Samo learning. He set his who, where robot for rocket physicist and genius class. While it worked, he dictated to his steno robot the following brief message. Dear fellow scientist, a project is contemplated that will have a crucial bearing on man's future in deep space. Ample non-military government funds are available. There was a time when professional men scoffed at the thinkers. Then there was a time when the thinkers her force neglected the professional men. Now, both times are past. May they never return. I would like to consult you this afternoon. Three o'clock sharp, Thinkers Foundation 1. George Helmuth. Meanwhile, the who, where, had tossed out a dozen cards. He glanced through them, hesitated at the name. Willard Farquhar looked at the sleeping girl, then quickly tossed them all into the addresso robot and plunged and plugged in the steno robot. The buzz light blinked green, and he switched the phone to audio. The president is waiting to see Maisie, sir, a clear feminine voice announced. He has the general staff with him. Martian peace to him, George Helmuth said. Tell him I will be down in a few minutes. Huge as a primitive nuclear reactor, the great electronic brain loomed above the knot of hush-faced men. It almost filled a two-story room in the Thinker's Foundation. Its front was an orderly expanse of controls, indicators, telltales, and terminals, the upper ones reached by a chair on a boom. Although as far as anyone knew, it could sense only the information and questions fed into it on a tape, the human visitors could not resist the impulse to talk in whispers and glance uneasily at the great cryptic cube after all, it had lately taken to moving some of its own controls, the permissible ones, and could doubtless improvise a hearing apparatus if it wanted to. For this was the thinking machine beside which the marks and eniacs and maniacs and matidas and minervas and mimmers were less than morons. This was the machine with a million times as many synapses as the human brain, the machine that remembered by cutting delicate notches in the rims of molecules instead of kindergarten paper punching or the Coney Island shimmying of columns of mercury. This was the machine that had given instructions on building the last three quarters of itself. This was the goal, perhaps, towards which fallible human reasoning and biased human judgment and feeble human ambition had involved. This was the machine that really thought. A million plus. This was the machine that the timid cyberneticists and stuffy professional scientists had said could not be built. Yet this was the machine that the thinkers, with characteristic Yankee push, had built and nicknamed, with characteristic Yankee irreverence and girl fondness, Maisie. Gazing up at it, the President of the United States felt a cord plucked within him that hadn't been sounded for decades. The dark and shivery organ cord of his Baptist childhood. Here, in a strange sense, although his reason rejected it, he felt he stood face to face with the living God, infinitely stern with the sternness of reality, yet infinitely just. No tiniest error or willful misstep could ever escape the scrutiny of this vast mentality. He shivered. The grizzled general... There was always one who was gray, was thinking that this was a very odd link in the chain of command. Some shadowy and well-controlled memories from World War II faintly stirred his ire. Here he was giving orders to a being immeasurably more intelligent than himself, and always orders of the tell-me-how-to-kill-that-man rather than the kill-that-man sort. The distinction bothered him obscurely. It relieved him to know that Maisie had built-in controls which made her always the servant of humanity or of humanity's right-minded leaders. Even the thinkers weren't certain which. 
The gray general was thinking uneasily, and like the president, at a more turbid level, of the resemblance between papal infallibility and the dictates of the machine. Suddenly, his bony wrists began to tremble. He asked himself, was this the second coming? Mightn't an incarnation be in metal rather than flesh? The austere secretary of state was remembering what he'd taken such pains to make everyone forget. His youthful flirtation at Lake Success with the Buddhism. Sitting here before his guru, his teacher, feeling the Occidental's awe at the wisdom of the East, or its pretense, he felt, he had felt a little like this. The burly secretary of space, who had come up through United Rockets, was thanking his stars at any rate. The professional scientists weren't responsible for this job. Like the grizzled general, he'd always felt suspicious of men who kept telling you how to do things rather than doing them themselves. In World War III, he'd had his fill of the professional physicists with their eternal taint of a misty sort of radicalism and free thinking. The thinkers were better, more disciplined, more human. They'd called their brain machine Maisie, which helped take the curse off her somewhat. The president's secretary, a potchy veteran of party caucuses, was also glad that it was the thinkers who had curated the machine, though he trembled at the power that it gave them over the administration. Still, you could do business with the thinkers, and nobody, not even the thinkers, could do business, that sort of business, with Maisie. Before that, that great square face, with its thousands of tiny metal features, only George Helmuth seemed at ease. Busily entering on the tape the complexity or the complex questions of the day that the high officials had handed him, logistics for the endless war in Pakistan, optimum size for next year's sugar corn crop, current thought threads, current thought trends in average Soviet minds, profound questions yet many of them phrased with surprising simplicity. For figures, technical jargon, and layman's language were alike to Maisie. There was no need to translate into mathematical shorthand, as with the lesser brain machines. The click of the tapper went on until the Secretary of State had twice nervously fired a cigarette with, an ultra, with his ultrasonic lighter and twice, as, and twice quickly put it away. No one spoke. George looked up at the Secretary of Space. Section five, question four. Whom would that come from? The burly man frowned. That would be the physics boys, Opperly's group. Is anything wrong? George did not answer. A bit later, he quit tapping and began to adjust controls, going up on the boom chair to reach some of them. Eventually, he came down and touched a few more, then stood waiting. From the great cube came a profound, steady purring. Involuntarily, the six officials backed off a bit. Somehow it was impossible for a man to get used to the sound of Maisie starting to think. George turned, smiling. And now, gentlemen, while we wait for Maisie to celebrate, there should be just enough time for us to watch the takeoff of the Mars rocket. He switched on a giant television screen. The others made a quarter turn, and there before them glowed the rich ochres and blues of a New Mexico sunrise, and in the middle distance, a silvery spindle. Like the generals, the Secretary of Space suppressed a scowl. Here was something that ought to be sprang in the center of his official territory that ought to be spang in the center of his official territory, and the thinkers had locked him completely out of it. That rocket there, just an ordinary Earth satellite vehicle commanded from the army, but equipped by the thinkers, with Maisie designed nuclear motors capable of the Mars journey and more, the first spaceship and the Secretary of Space was not in on it. Still, he told himself. Maisie had decreed it that way, and when he remembered what the thinkers had done for him in recruiting, in rescuing him from the breakdown with their mental science, from breakdown with their mental science, in rescuing the whole administration from collapse, he realized that he had to be satisfied, and that was without taking into consideration the amazing additional mental discoveries that the thinkers were bringing down from Mars. Lord, the president said to George as if voicing the secretary's feelings. I wish you people could bring a couple of those wise little devils back with you this trip. Be a good thing for the country. George looked at him a bit coldly. It's quite unthinkable, he said. 
The telepathic abilities of the Martians make them extremely sensitive. The conflicts of ordinary earth minds would impinge on them psychic would impinge on them psychotically, even fatally. As you know, the thinkers were able to contact them only because of our degree of learned mental poise and errorless memory chains. So for the present, it must be our task alone to glean from the Martians their astounding mental skills. Of course, someday in the future, when we have discovered how to armor the minds of the Martians. Sure, I know, the president said hastily. Shouldn't have mentioned it, George. Conversation ceased. They waited with growing tension for the great violet flames to bloom from the base of the silvery shaft. Meanwhile, the question tape, like a New Year's streamer, tossed out a high window into the night, sped on its dark way along spinning rollers, curling with an intricate aimlessness curiously like that of such a stream of such a streamer it tantalized the silvery fingers of a thousand relays saucily evaded the glances of ten thousand electric eyes impishly darted down a narrow black alleyway of memory banks and reaching the center of the cube suddenly emerged into a small room where a suave fat man in shorts sat drinking beer he flipped the tape over to him with with practiced finger Eyeing it as a stockbroker might have studied a ticker tape, he read the first question, closed his eyes, and frowned for five seconds. Then, with the staccato self-confidence of a hack writer, he began to tape out the answer. For many minutes, the only sounds were the rustle of the paper ribbon and the click of the tapper, except for the seconds the fat man took to close his eyes or drink beer. Once, too, he lifted a phone asked a concise question, waited half a minute, listened to an answer, then went back to the grind, until he came to section five, question four. That time, he did his thinking with his eyes opened. The question was, does Maisie stand for Maisel? He sat for a while, slowly scratching his thigh. His loose, persuasive lips tightened without closing into the shape of a snarl. Suddenly, he began to tape again, Maisie does not stand for Maisel. Maisie stands for amazing, humorously given in the form of a girl's name. Section 6, answer 1. The midterm election of UCAS should be spaced as follows. But his lips didn't lose the shape of a snarl. 500 miles above the ionosphere, the Mars rocket cut off its fuel and slumped gratefully into the orbit that would carry it effortlessly around the world at that altitude. The pilot unstrapped himself and stretched but he didn't look out the viewport at the dried mud disk that was Earth, cloaked in the haze of blue sky. He knew he had two maddening months ahead of him in which to do little more than that. Instead, he unstrapped Sappho, used to free fall two previous experiences, and loving it, the fluffy little cat was soon bounding about the cabin in curves and gyrations that would have made her the envy of all back alley and parlor felines on the planet below, a miracle cat in the dream world of free fall. For a long time, she played with a string that the man would toss out lazily. Sometimes she caught the string on the fly. Sometimes she swam for it frantically. After a while, the man grew bored with the game. He unlocked a drawer and began to study the details of the wisdom he would discover on the on this Mars trip, a priceless, priceless spiritual insights that would be balm to a war-battered mankind. The cat carefully selected a spot three feet off the floor, curled up in the air, and went to sleep. Georges Helmuth snipped the emerging answer tape into sections and handed each to the appropriate man. Most of them carefully tucked theirs away with little more than a glance, but the Secretary of State puzzled over his. Who the devil would Maisel be, he asked. A remote look came into the eyes of the Secretary of State. Edgar Allan Poe, he said frowningly, with eyes half closed. The grizzled general snapped his fingers. Sure, Maisel's chess player. Read it when I was a kid, about an automaton that played chess. Poe proved it had a man inside it. The Secretary of Space frowned. Now what's the point of a fool question like that? You said it came from Opperly's group? George asked sharply. The Secretary of Space nodded. The others looked at the two men puzzlingly. Puzzledly, who would that be? George pressed. The group, I mean, the Secretary of State shrugged. Oh, the usual little bunch over at the Institute. 
Hindman, Gregory, Opperly himself. Oh, yes, and young Farquhar. Sounds like Opperly's getting senile, George commented coldly. I'd investigate. The Secretary of Space nodded. He suddenly looked tough. I will, right away. Sunlight striking through French windows spotlighted a ballet of dust motes untroubled by air conditioning. Morton Opperly's living room was well kept, but worn and quite behind the times. Instead of reading tapes, there were books. Instead of steno robots, pen and ink. While in place of a four by six TV screen, a Picasso hung on the wall. Only Opperly knew that the painting was still faintly radioactive, that it had been risky, so when he'd smuggled it out of his bomb singed apartment, that it had been riskily so when he smuggled it out of his bomb singed apartment in New York City. The two physicists fronted each other across a coffee table. The face of the elder was cadaverous, large-eyed and tender, fined down by a long life of abstract thought. That of the younger was forceful, sinuous, bulky as his body, and exceptionally ugly. He looked rather like a bear. Opperly was saying, So when he asked who was responsible for the Maisel question, I said I didn't remember. He smiled. They still allow me my absent-mindedness since it nourishes their contempt. Almost my sole remaining privilege. The smile faded. Why do you keep on teasing the zoo animals, Willard? He asked without rancor. I've maintained many times that we shouldn't truckle to them by yielding to their demand that we ask Maisie questions. You and the rest have overruled me. But then, to use those questions to convey veiled insults isn't reasonable. Apparently, the Secretary of Space was bothered enough about this last one to pay me a copter call within 20 minutes of this morning's meeting at the Foundation. Why do you do it, Willard? The features of the other convulsed unpleasantly. Because the thinkers are charlatans who must be exposed, he rapped out. We know their Maisie is no more than a tea leaf reading fake. We've traced their Mars rockets and found they go nowhere. We know their Martian mental science is bunk. But we've already exposed the thinkers very thoroughly, Opperly interposed again. Opperly interposed quietly. You know the good it did, Farquhar hunched his Japanese wrestler's shoulders. Then it's got to be done until it takes. Opperly studied the bowl of lilies of the valley by the coffee pot. I think you just want to tease the animals for some personal reason, of which you probably aren't aware. Farquhar scowled. We're the ones in the cages. Opperly continued his inspection of the flower bed of the flower bells of the flowers bells. All the more reason not to poke sticks through the bars of the lions and tigers strolling outside. No, Willard, I'm not. Co- I'm not counseling appeasement, but consider the age in which we live. It wants magicians. His voice grew especially tranquil. A scientist tells people the truth when times are good. That is when the truth offers no threat. People don't mind. But when times are very, very bad, a shadow darkened his eyes. We all know what happened to... And he mentioned three names that had been household words in the middle of the century. They were names on brass plaques dedicated to the three martyred physicians. He went on, A magician, on the other hand, tells people what they wish were true. The perpetual motion works, that cancer can be cured by colored lights, that a psychosis is no worse than a head cold, and they'll live forever. In good times, magicians are laughed at. They're a luxury of the spoiled wealthy few, but in bad times, people sell their souls for magic cures and buy perpetual motion machines to power their war rockets. Farquhar clenched his fists. All the more reason to keep chipping away at the thinkers. Are we supposed to beg off from a job because it's difficult and dangerous? Opperly shook his head. We're to keep clear of the infection of violence. In my day, Willard, I was one of the frightened men. Later, I was one of the angry men, and then one of the minds of despair. Now I'm convinced that all my posturings were futile. Exactly, Farquhar agreed harshly. You postured, you didn't act. If you men who discovered atomic energy had only formed a secret league, if you'd only had the foresight and the guts to use your tremendous bargaining position to demand the power to shape mankind's future, by the time you were born, Willard, Opperly interrupted dreamily, Hitler was merely a name in in the history books. We scientists weren't the stuff out of which cloak and dagger men are made. Can you imagine Oppenheimer wearing a mask or Einstein sneaking into the old White House with a bomb in his briefcase? He smiled. 
Besides, that's not the way power is seized. New ideas aren't useful to the men bargaining for power. His weapons are established facts or lies. Just the same, it would have been a good thing if you'd had little violence in you. No, Opperly said. I've got violence in me, Farquhar announced, shoving himself to his feet. Opperly looked up from the flowers. I think you have, he agreed. But what are we to do, Farquhar demanded. Surrender the world to charlatans without a struggle? Opperly mused for a while. I don't know what the world needs now. Everyone knows Newton as the great scientist. Few remember that he spent half his life muddling with alchemy, looking for the philosopher's stone. That was the pebble by the seashore he really wanted to find. Now you are just now you're justifying the thinkers. No, I leave that to history. And history consists of the actions of men, Farquhar concluded. I intend to act. The thinkers are vulnerable. Their power fantastically precarious. What's it based on? A few lucky guesses? Faith healing? Some science hocus-pocus on the level of those jukebox burlesque acts between the strips? Dubious mental comfort given to a few nerve-torn neurotics in the inner cabinet and their wives? The fact that the thinker's clever stage managing won the president a doubtful election? The erroneous belief that the Soviets pulled out of Iraq and Iran because of the thinker's mind-bomb threat? A brain machine that's just a cover for Jan Terrig... For Jan Trigoron's guesswork, oh yes, and that hogwash of Martian wisdom, all of it mere bluff. A few pushes to the right at the right times, and points are all that are needed. And the thinkers know it. I'll bet they've terrified. I bet they're terrified already, and will be more so when they find out we're gunning for them. Eventually, they'll be making overtures to us, turning to us for help. You wait and see. I am thinking again of Hitler. Opperly interposed quietly. On his first half dozen big steps, he had nothing but bluff. His generals were against him. They knew they were in a cardboard fort, yet he won every battle until the last. Moreover, he pressed on, cutting Farquhar short. The power of the thinkers isn't based on what they've got, but on what the world hasn't got. Peace, honor, a good conscience, and we'll pause there.